Good morning. Nice to see you and happy to have you online to join us today. We are here to continue in our, our Advent and just get excited about Christ coming. So if you would like to stand with us, sing a couple hymns, Christian hymns or Christmas hymns. Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and wise. Give ye heed to what we say. News, news, Jesus Christ is born today. House and land before him bow, and he is in the manger now. Christ is born today. Christ is born today. exciting things going on at our church. Even during this time, we are excited. Um, as you know, we had a Sunday morning Bible study at 845, um, led by Jerry Poe and Charles Schmitz, and it's on Zoom, so contact them if you want to do that. Um, Monday night with Barb, we've got Psalms Bible study, and that's a hybrid Zoom and here as well. And then Pastor Nathan's devotional on Wednesdays at 6 o'clock on Facebook. And then it's also on our website later on. And then the youth group is going to be involved with as many people as possible to go caroling tonight. We are going to meet here at the church. And we're going to go see Sarah Jane and Ramona. I mean, we're going to have to wave at them because they're, you know, in a high-rise um, place for um, older people, and then we're going to also go see Lucille Ferrar, um, where she lives, and they're going to give us some cookies, and then we're going to go, we're going to pop in at different people's homes, so you'd never know if we might pop in 
Um, we are going to be safe with our caroling because obviously that is um, important for us to be safe. So put that on your calendar. I mean, you, you might have to get really warm and wear your warmest clothing, okay, because, you know, it's, it's kind of cold. Um, so, and then today, we have another exciting um, um, event that's happening. We're, our women, mentoring women, we're going to have a, a luncheon today after church. It's a taco bar. And if you didn't bring anything, you don't have to. We, it's all taken care of. You're good. So it's going to be right after church, downstairs. And again, we have found a way to social distance um, and still enjoy each other's company. In fact, they had the ladies' luncheon yesterday, and they were able to do that as well. Um, so the angel tree, that you, those of you who haven't seen it, but we have a, a tree out in the foyer that has tags on it that has different items that we want to be able to give to people this Christmas. So um, we're doing pretty good, but we, there's still a few more tags, or if you want to send the money in um, and via the church. We, we had someone send that in yesterday, right, Pastor Nathan? And they're asking us to do the shopping. No problem. We can do that. Uh, we just want to help make other people's Christmases even brighter. You know, it's not all about the presents, but it's really about the giving, right? Um, so have them here by next Sunday, um, the 20th. And if you could wrap them, that would be really helpful. All right, you guys tired of hearing me? Okay. Um, ah, this is some new news. Okay, so you know how we ended our Bible, one of our ladies' Bible studies oh, a month or two ago. Well, we have decided we're going to start a new one, and we already have a book picked out. It is called Women of the Bible, and what is really cool about it is that there are, I think there's like 52 chapters, of, or 52 Bible studies, and we're going to do that for the next three years, okay? Is that Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, we have got a combination of leaders who are going to lead that um, every two weeks. We're going to meet on the first and the third Thursday. So for those ladies, and we are doing it Zoom. We're doing it via Zoom, so it's all online. And again, it's we had a gal who um, joined us, our last Bible study, who's in western Kansas. Um, so it's been wonderful. We pray for each other. We support each other. And we're doing this. So there is a sign-up um, out there um, at the church, and, or else you can contact us online. If, the reason for the sign-up really is so that we know to send you a Zoom link. You can't be a part of this unless you have a Zoom link. And since I'm the one who apparently knows about Zoom, hmm, I, let me know. Because um, anyway, that's pretty exciting. Last but not least... We are going to have a Christmas Eve service, but it's not going to be in person. It won't be here. Um, we are going to pre-record it, and it will be um, available. Well, there's more details to come, but it should be available Christmas Eve. So you can do that with your families and, or afterwards, but it's just going to be simplified. But it's going to mean a lot. So maybe you can start planning on... Um, on that with your family say hey let's just you know tune on the computer or whatever whatever way you can see it and and join us i think that's it okay thanks This keeps me going On those days when I feel like giving up Fire I believe The storm will soon be over I believe The rain will go away Make it through it. Oh, I believe it's already done. I 
want you to already see yourself out of the storm. The clouds will move. It's time for you to smile again. Mm. Come on, Sean. I believe my family will get better. I believe God will provide. I believe the promise that He made. Blessing is yours. God's already pre approved you for it. Come on, Zacardi. I believe that my God is a healer. Yes, He is. And I believe that I will survive. Oh, I, I believe that God is able. tells us that if any two of us shall agree on anything on earth, that God will do it for us in heaven. And I know sometimes life has a way of knocking you down to the point where you can't even pray for yourself. But today, I want to agree with you that it's getting ready to get better. And right now, we are giving your problems an expiration date. And we're saying it's over. That you've been crying long enough. That you've been worried long enough. That you've been struggling long enough. And I believe that God's gonna do it for you. I believe, hey, God's gonna do it. Yes, He will. I believe, it's gonna get better for you.
Thank you, Mia. That's awesome. I believe. Perhaps there is no better example of love in action than Jesus Christ, God's one and only Son, born of a virgin, conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit. He is God incarnate, walking among us, come to hold us, come to look into our eyes, come to hold our trembling hands and to lift our weary heads. In Isaiah 7, it is foretold, behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel. God is with us, and God is for us. In John 3.16, we are told, For God so loved the world that he gave his, only, his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God's gracious gift is offered to each one of us in the person of Jesus Christ. That is God's gift. That is God's love in action. Love in action can surprise us. Wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a humble manger, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the promised Messiah who would take away the sins of the world. Love in action is extravagant, miraculously transforming water to wine, restore, restoring sight to the blind. Causing the lame to walk and even the dead to rise. Love is forever. We have an eternal father and a forever family through Christ. First John reminds us to see the great love the father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Today we light the candle of hope, peace, and love. Love will rule and reign. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. May we respond to his extravagant love today through the confessing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, turning away from sin and living for him. To Mary, gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Oh, 
virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You who bring good tidings in Zion, go up on the high mountain. You who bring good tidings in Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Yeah. 
God, we come to you today with uncertainty as we don't know what the future may hold. But we know that you're still sitting on the throne. As we enter this time of preparing for the coming of your son, that we continue to believe in you. We pray that you help us prepare our hearts and continue to guide us in our walks, Lord. I pray for Nathan as he brings his message today that you use him to speak to us and that we open our hearts to what you have to say, Lord. I pray for those that are been affected by COVID, whether it's financial struggle or those who've gotten sick. We don't know what the road has in front of us, but we know that you are still there, Lord. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, our children are dismissed at this time to continue their worship downstairs. Pastor John and This morning, it just seems like um, we have run into roadblock after roadblock. So, uh, you thank you for bearing with us, and I want to say a thank you, a special big thank you to Randy Lane and Griffin, Pastor Griffin, for helping us uh, out back back there today and in, in playing. Uh, Randy's been playing double role this morning as. Uh, Brother Joe was not feeling well and went back to the doctor, to his doctor this week on Thursday to get, and he, they tested him for COVID. Of course, he has to be, he doesn't think he has that, but they quarantine him until they have the results for that, so that's why we miss him today. But uh, normally, it takes care of all of our sound needs. Randy is doubling that with the camera and the sound, and Griffin's stepping in also to help us in that area. And then we got ready for uh, my microphone I usually put on, and we have two of them, actually. Both of them broke. So that's why you see me holding this mic, and I don't like not having my hands free, so who knows what I'll be doing uh, today. But uh, in spite of whatever the devil throws at us, we're still going to carry on. Amen? And, uh, and thank you, and even the other microphone that quit working, as the, the Andrews found out earlier. But... <laughs> Thank you, all everybody who participates. It's it's uh, it takes all of us working together. So thank you very much, you all. Appreciate it. I invite you this morning to God's Word, Saint John chapter one, Saint John chapter one, and we are going to begin at verse six, and then we'll jump down a little bit later in the in the chapter. John chapter 1, beginning of verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now this was John's... Now we're down to verse 19, I'm sorry. Verse 19 Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally they said, well who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Well, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? He said, I baptize baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. And may God add his blessing to his word. Shall we recite our motto together once again? All together. Heavenly Father, I give you permission to speak to me, to speak through me, to do whatever you want with my life. I trust the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. I wonder, I wonder if you have ever given any thought to the extent of the preparations involved when the President of the United States makes a visit to a local community. Just, just wondering if you've ever thought about all that goes into the preparations of a presidential visit. A former agent with the FBI tells about some of those preparations. A team of Secret Service personnel checks out every building along the route he will travel and near every place that he will be appearing, he says. They go over each building with a fine-tooth comb from roof to basement in their efforts to prepare for his safety. We often refer to people like this as advanced pe people or persons. They work <laughs> invisibly behind the scenes to make sure that everything is ready for the big event that's about to take place. Advanced people or advancement. Very important to any well-known person or person who moves from town to town. Well, I throw that out there just to get our attention towards that idea because Jesus had an advancement. Someone who was in charge of preparing the way for his coming. And that advance man was, of course, John the Baptist. The advance man. Now, you might find this interesting that John wasn't hired by Jesus for this task. No, the prophet Isaiah assigned this task to him 400 years before. 400 years before Isaiah assigned him, the prophet, this task. And we're very familiar with the, the prophet Isaiah foretelling about John's coming in Isaiah chapter 40. Verses 3 to 5, it's what he says. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The, the rough ground shall become leveled. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That was the words of Isaiah. So the appearance of John the Baptist in the wilderness was the most important event in the life of Israel for more than 400 years. Wow. 400 years. It had been that long since a prophet of God had lifted his voice to proclaim the word of the Lord. Now, understandably, probably you and I would not have been drawn to the preaching of John the Baptist. After all, yeah, it, we, we probably would not have been uh, drawn to, to him at all because he was a man clothed in camel's hair and wild animals' skins and subsiding on a diet of locusts and wild honey living out in the wilderness wouldn't seem to have much to say about the way we live our lives, right? So we probably wouldn't pay him a whole lot of attention. His appearance was eccentric. His preaching was quite morbid. All about sin and repentance and stuff like that. You know. Calling people snakes and warning them of the wrath that was to come. We wouldn't like that, would we? Because... We, we like our sins treated more gently, right? And probably we'd rather prefer them not to be mentioned at all, <laughs> if we're to be honest about it. In fact, from his birth, says Dr. Fred Craddock, John was set aside as a Nazarite. Now, a Nazarite was a 
person who was devoted to God and therefore lived away from society. A Nazarite was a person who was devoted to God and lived away from the society. A Nazarite didn't trim the beard, didn't cut their hair. They lived in an unusual way. It didn't, it didn't tell us if they took showers or not, I don't know. But you kind of get the idea, right? In fact, I don't know that they had showers back then, did they? Well, that's why he lived in the river. I don't know. I'm just putting, that, putting two and two together. But with all that going on, there's two things that surprise us then about John the Baptist. One is how popular he was. And the other is his role in the drama of that first Christmas. How popular he was and the role he played in the first Christmas. As to his popularity, the book of Mark, Mark's gospel, tells us in Mark chapter 1 verse 5 that the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him confessing their sins. They were baptizing, baptized by him in the Jordan River. That's, that's quite an amazing response, isn't it, to this wilderness preacher? I mean, can you imagine every single person in a large metropolitan area and in all the surrounding countryside repenting of their sins and being baptized in a river? Huh. I can't, it just wouldn't happen, would it? I just can't imagine that. Now, over the years, we understand that there have been many outstanding preachers, but none of them as effective as John the Baptist. None of them. In fact, in Belfast, Belfast Ireland in the 1920s, there was a very well-known but somewhat strange preacher named William Nich Nicholson, whose ministry kind of bore a resemblance to John the Baptist's ministry. Nicholson did things that most preachers would never do. For example, he would call out people from the pulpit on their peculiarities and their manner of dress. In other words, he just kind of told it like it was. Whatever he saw in front of him, that's what he saw, and he'd call you out on it. <laughs> people seemed to love hearing him preach, though. They seemed to love being roasted from the pulpit. But he was known for that. In fact, he was nicknamed the Tornado of the Pulpit. And he aimed his ministry at men. Particularly men who worked in the shipyards there in Belfast. It's it said that his straightforward language communicated to the common man. William Nicholson would go to the massive shipyards in Belfast at lunchtime. He would conduct Bible studies and preached to the men during their lunch breaks. Thousands of people claimed to have been converted under his ministry. And because of that, the sense of repentance that came upon the shipyard workers from his preaching, that things that they had borrowed from the company, had, and taken, they had taken bits of equipment and inventory and all that kind of stuff, they were returned. They didn't know what to do with all of it. The Belfast shipyard built a shed. And they named the shed the Nicholson Shed. And they built it to house all the stolen tools and things that the newly converted workers were returning as a result of Nicholson's preaching. They had, in fact, as it grew, they ended up having to rent a building in town in order to store all the stuff. People were so under conviction, they returned everything. Well, that seems to be the kind of preacher that John the Baptist was. But there was one fact that set John the Baptist apart from all other preachers. Among those who came to John the Baptist to be baptized was a young carpenter. In fact, he was a cousin of John the Baptist named Jesus of Nazareth. Anybody heard of him? But we're kind of getting ahead of our story here today. Today we want to know about John's role in that first Christmas story. So in Luke's gospel, in his 
gospel begins his, his version of the Christmas story, not with Mary and Joseph, but with a couple named Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah was a priest. He and Elizabeth were deeply religious people who did their very best to keep all of God's commandments. And late in life, they were childless, much to their sorrow. And one day, while Zechariah was going about his priestly functions in the temple, he was startled by the appearance of an angel. It was our old friend Gabriel. Remember Gabriel? The angel. Gabriel. Gabriel, in Luke chapter 1, verse 13, Gabriel says, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, Gabriel said. Your prayers have been heard. Elizabeth, your wife, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Well, Zechariah was nearly knocked off his feet. He couldn't believe it. In verse 18, Luke chapter 1, How can I know this is true? He said, I'm an old man myself, and my wife is getting up in years. Then verse 19 of Luke 1, I am Gabriel, the angel answered, and I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to you and to tell you this good news. So as a sign to Zechariah that this message was true, he was literally struck speechless. He couldn't speak. He couldn't talk. He tried, but he couldn't. That's what happened. That's probably how you and I would probably... Uh, feel under similar circumstances <laughs> we wouldn't be able to speak either being old and pregnant wow <laughs> i for sure would shake my head <laughs> well this this new infant was born or when this new infant was born there was so much joy in the home of zechariah and elizabeth in luke 159 on the eighth day, which was customary, they, they took him to be circumcised. And it was also custom when they did that ceremony, they would actually name the child on that day. Family and friends all there, they thought that the infant boy was going to be named Zechariah after his father. But in verse 60 of Luke 1, it says, But Elizabeth spoke up and said, Oh no, his name is John. His name is John. But none of your relatives are called John. All the friends and family that were there said, none of your relatives are called John. And, and so they made signs. They made signs to poor mute Zechariah to see what name he wanted the child to have. Well, verse 63 of Luke chapter 1, Zechariah asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote the words, His name is John. And at that very moment, Zechariah, his speech was restored. And he was able to talk again. You can read, I'm not making this up. It's really there. The neighbors and friends, they were all awestruck. And the news of these events spread throughout Judea. And the people asked in verse 66 of Luke chapter 1, What's this child's future going to be? For as Luke says, the Lord's blessing was plainly upon him. Well, it was six months after Gabriel had given the joyous news to Zechariah and to Elizabeth that he would, to Zechariah, that he was going to father a son, that Gabriel, the same angel, also appeared to a young woman in Nazareth named Mary. And Gabriel's message to Mary was that she too was going to bear a son, but not just any son. No. <laughs> He would be the son of a most high God. And his name would be Jesus. Hmm. Well, Mary was a cousin to Elizabeth. You got that? Mary was a cousin to Elizabeth. And they must, they must have been really close as cousins. In fact, as the scripture tells us, that Mary spent three months of her pregnancy living with Zechariah and Elizabeth. In fact... Elizabeth was the first person in the scriptures to declare Jesus is Lord. 
first person in the scripture to declare that Jesus is Lord was Elizabeth. And, and you'll find the whole story in the first chapter of Luke. If you think I'm, I'm making this up, I'm not. It's there. But as you are aware, we, we know very little about Jesus' childhood, right? However, in, in view of Mary and Elizabeth's close relationship, we can really kind of speculate and figure that young John the Baptist and his six-month younger cousin, Jesus, they probably spent a lot of time together. Maybe they, they, they probably played together. They maybe even went fishing together. Probably did. All those things that kids like to do. They did it. And so that might explain the kind of man John the Baptist became. He, he was in intimate contact with Jesus. And cousins can certainly have that kind of influence on each other, can't they? Some of you may be able to attest to that here today. Well, this would also explain John the Baptist's reaction when he saw Jesus come out with the others to be baptized. In fact, Matthew tells us that John was reluctant to baptize his younger cousin. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 14, John said, I need you to baptize me. That's what, that's what he said. And John was protesting, I can't baptize you, you need to be baptizing me. So that, that says something really special to me about Jesus' character as a youth and a young adult to me. In fact, the Jewish historian, Josephus, affirms that John the Baptist's ministry was a stunning success. Untold numbers of people from all over the area came to be baptized by John the Baptist. Um, in the River Jordan, right, right there. Many of those people who were baptized became his disciples. Followed him. They studied with, with John. They, they sought to follow him as, as others later were to follow Jesus. The same way. In fact... Two of Jesus' most prominent disciples, Andrew and John, were originally followers of John the Baptist. You'll remember that one of the most gifted and influential preachers mentioned in the book of Acts was a man by the name of Apollos. Apollos, who according to Acts 18.25 was originally baptized as a disciple of John. So all these things telling us about John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. But there's three things I want us to notice specifically about John this morning. Number one, consider the humility of this man, John. Consider the humility of this man, John. Look at it here in our, in our text today. John chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, where John says, I baptize with water. John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Wow. Now, this says a lot about Jesus. If John was unfit to untie his shoes, his sandals, it says a lot about Jesus. But it also says a lot about John. He was a man of great humility. In fact, New Testament scholar Don Jewell once pointed out that in this chapter, John the Baptist becomes the man who is not. <laughs> he becomes the man who is not. When the priests and the Levites ask him who he is, look at what he, he replies that he is not the light. He is not the Christ. He is not Elijah. He is not the final prophet. Then he adds, He is not worthy to untie the true one's sandals. And he is not the one who is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist had a kind of reverse resume. Right? <laughs> 
because typically, I mean, you understand, typically on, on resumes, you list all kind of things that you are and all your accomplishments, right? All the things you've done and accomplished and everything like that. But, but John had a resume that was like a photographic negative. <laughs> Before he could say who he was and what he had come to do, he had to go on and on to say who he was not and what his work would not, would not be about. That's what he had to do. So in spite of his own popularity, John sought to direct attention not to himself but to Jesus. In spite of his own popularity, he sought to direct attention not to himself, but to Jesus. And that kind of humility is a rare commodity even today. Amen? <laughs> ah, it, it, it was not his intent to draw attention to himself. His greatest desire was to glorify Jesus. His greatest desire was to glorify Jesus. The great com composer and conductor Leonard Bernstein once said that the hardest instrument to play is second fiddle. The hardest instrument to play is the second fiddle. Well, John willingly took on the part of second fiddle. John was a humble man. The second thing to notice is that he was also a man of enormous courage. He was a man of enormous courage. Now the ending to John's life was quite tragic actually. As you know, he offended the royal family of his day. We might be able to relate to that. He offended the royal family of his day by confronting them with their sin. And for his efforts, he was beheaded. He took his head off. John the Baptist was a preacher of righteousness. And he would not betray his convictions. He was a preacher of righteousness. And he would not betray his convictions. The world has always been made better by men and women of such character. May God help us. May God help me. Some of you might remember, you might remember a, a young Wall Street Journal reporter by the name of Daniel Pearl. Daniel Pearl was a man of Jewish faith, and he was working at the time as the South Asia Bureau Chief of the Wall Street Journal. He was based in Mumbai, India, and he and his wife, Mary Ann, had not been married very long, and she was expecting their first baby. And then in 2002, a great tragedy occurred in their lives. Daniel Pearl was kidnapped when he went to Pakistan as a part of, a, of an investigation into the alleged links between the British citizen Richard Reed, known as the Shoe Bomber, and Al-Qaeda. You might remember what happened to Daniel Pearl. He was decapitated like John the Baptist. And his, his captors filmed, and, uh, filmed the whole execution and they released it on video and circulated it online for all the world to see. What a horrible, horrible thing. Daniel Pearl paid the ultimate price for his commitment to his country. But John the Baptist paid the ultimate price for his commitment to God. John was a man of humility and courage. Great courage. But just as impressive, however, was his number three, his determination to bear witness to the light. His determination to bear witness to the light. John bore witness to the light in his preaching. And he bore witness in his life, the way he lived. And he practiced what he preached. On the banks of the Jordan River, he proclaimed that the kingdom of God was at hand. 
When, when he saw Jesus, he declared in verse 29 of the chapter we just read, John chapter 1, in verse 29, which we didn't read, but you see it there, he declared, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. John was the ultimate advancement. He prepared the way for the coming Messiah. So, brothers and sisters, as you celebrate this Advent and Christmas season, as you think about the shepherds and the wise men and the star and Mary and Joseph and all the rest of the important figures and events of that first Christmas, give a little thought to another small child born six months before Christ. To a deeply devout couple named Zechariah and Elizabeth. Their son was not the Messiah. He simply bore witness to the Messiah. No, there was no star shining over the house where he lay. Just a mute old man beaming down with pride and great joy. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It was the joy, it was the joy of one who had lived to see the promises of God fulfilled in the world. It was plain, it was plain at John's birth according to Luke, that the Lord's blessing was upon him, and it was. He grew into a man of humility and courage and proclaimed the coming of the Lord. In fact, Jesus himself composed John's epitaph when he said on one occasion in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, no greater man has ever been born than John. What an epitaph. Composed by Jesus himself. No greater man has ever been born than John. Yes, that was John the Baptist. Humility, courage, and a commitment to bear the witness to the light of God. Say, so why is that important for us on this Advent Sunday? It's important for us because, brothers and sisters, that's our goal through this Advent and Christmas season to bear witness to the light of God are we who we say we are we had great conversation yesterday Derek and Amanda and Susie and I we and we talked about not about being what you do in life your job where you work becoming your identity but who are you Who are you? And, and what do you do with that? What is your purpose in life? All of us share this purpose. To bear witness to the light of God. How He is working in your life. Are you letting Him work in your life? And then are you sharing that with others? Bearing witness to the light of God. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your word this morning. The weeks, these weeks of Advent are, are a time for hope and, and joy. They are. And as we move through this season of anticipation, I pray, Lord, you would help us to recognize that, that we, we do not do your will when we keep our boldest and brightest hopes wrapped up like forgotten packages or, or closed up like unopened doors of the Advent calendar. So I pray, Lord, that you would enable us through acts of faith that reveal an active faith, to feel the joy that a child feels in discovering what, what's within the bright 
gift wrappings or behind the cardboard calendar doors. But as we move through this season of expectation, I pray, Lord, you would help us to reflect upon the, the wintry side of our spirits. And yes, we confess that to being much like the winter wind as we bluster against the fragile foolishness of hope. We confess of being like the frozen ground that's too rigid to be joyfully life-bearing. So I pray, Lord, that you would open us and warm us, O oh God, that our hope and our joy might serve as gifts of the coming Christ. And Lord, during this Advent season, would you send your light and your truth and let them lead us? And may we be faithful and obedient in following that. Let them, let them bring us to your holy heel. That as children of darkness, we yearn for light upon, upon our path. As children of fear, we long for imparted courage. As children of the moment, we long for some surety of eternity. As children of struggle, we, we long for forgiveness and peace. So Father, waken us. Awaken us to the meaning of this holy season by leading us into the deeper and closer walk with You. And help us to hear again the glad tidings of great joy given to all the people. And help us to hear again what the shepherds heard. And, and might we rejoice as, as they did on that night of miracles. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace. Lord, start with me. Start with us. Help us to realize our task in bearing witness to the light of God. Inspire us, I pray, that during this season we will experience again the renewal of faith. And Lord, help us to, to love you more and more. And, and from our deepened love to love one another as we are to love ourselves. Lord, help us to put on humility like John. Help us to be courageous like John. And then help us to bear witness to the light of God like John. And we will give you the praise for it all and the credit. In the strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And amen. Amen. Thank you. Would you stand with me, please, with me, please, and receive the benediction this morning? Praise God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, a joy to be able to together once again in His house, in His presence. Now, would you go out today with hearts that are filled with joy? The days of Advent require us to think deeply and lovingly of God's great work and His great grace among us. And this same God, whom we name as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, walks with us every step of the way, every day. <laughs> He's with you. Now go, and may the peace of Christ be with you all. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.